Hi, I am Mrs. Sloan, and this is a video for my AP Biology students. We are ready to transition into Unit 7. And so Unit 7 is all about natural selection. So I'm going to make myself a little bit smaller here and present to you. And for those of you that are new to my videos, um, what I do is uh, I provide the notes for you down in the descriptor of this video. And those notes are two column notes. Column one um, is scaffolding, and I'll help you fill in those notes. And column two, I encourage you to throw in pictures and images that help you with the understanding of the material. You can take them from my presentation. Um, there's a link to my presentation um, in the notes themselves um, or other things that help you from your classes. So we are about ready to move into unit seven here and I need a pointer and um, if you want to find my my site this this uh, bitly right here will take you to my site and what I provide for my students is um, unit guides um, and the topics that I list here um, all come from the college board and then down below I have um, helps and reviews and connections and links to Bozeman's and quizzes and Khan Academy in this document if you open it up. Um, so I encourage you to use those unit guides and check to make sure you understand what we're talking about because what the College Board expects from you. Um, for natural selection, this is one of the, the largest units. Uh, 13 to 20% of your exam questions will come from this unit. They assume on a regular class period, maybe 20 to 23 class periods, um, unless you have extended periods like my students do. So 7.1 through 7.13. For my students, we're gonna break this into two assessments, um, but we're going to be starting here with um, chapter 15 and we're going to talk about darwin and evolution and i'm going to break this chapter into two videos so this is video one all right and this chapter on the whole the this is the unit at a glance and i'm getting this directly from the college board so what we will address in these two videos on chapter 15 is an introduction to natural selection well, artificial selection, 7.6 is evidence for evolution. That will be video two from this chapter is evidence of evolution. Um, continually, we'll talk about common ancestry and continuing evolution. So of the 13 topics that you need to talk about on um, this chapter, one, two, three, four, five of them will be covered in this chapter over the course of two videos. And many of these topics are revisited again and again throughout this unit. All right. so. We're going to first talk about the history of evolutionary thought, um, what was going on before Darwin came up with his ideas. So first of all, I love this picture of this frog. So natural selection on the whole, what this whole unit is about, is a mechanism of evolution, the mechanism for that change over time, descent with modification. The theory that populations that are better adapted to their environment are the ones that are going to survive and reproduce. So clearly amongst this species of frog, being able to lift up your back hind leg like this is very attractive. And so these are the ones that survive and reproduce. And then when we look in part two of this video, um, next video, um, evolution is supported by scientific evidence from many different disciplines. So we'll look at geographical evidence, geological, physical evidence, biochemical, mathematical data will be used throughout this unit. So this is a piece of physical evidence. So here's a whale, it swims, you know that. But why, why do they have a hip bone and part of a femur? What does that tell you about orca here, right? Probably at one point, orca what? He walked, right? He walked. And so for this species to survive and reproduce the best, and fitness is your ability to pass on your genes, not how many push-ups and sit-ups, how fast you can run the mile, but how many of your genes get passed on. So for him to increase his fitness, um, it was better in the water than on land. So this mammal moved to the water um, in order to survive and reproduce. All right, and so the big guy in this chapter is Darwin. Um, so in 1831, he took a little trip on a boat, um, the HMS Beagle, and he was, I think, about 22 years old. I think I have it in the notes. Uh, yes, 
22 years old, and he went on a five-year voyage around um, South American coast, all the way around, and um, he made observations on his journey. And throughout the course of his journey, his thinking changed. Now, a little background on here, he went to school to be a clergyman. Um, actually, before that, he wanted to be a doctor, but he couldn't stomach the uh, that the surgery I'm assuming. And so then he was going to be a clergyman. So he had a background in religion, right? But in the time of when he was taking this trip, then there was just special creation, which you can believe that is perfectly fine, right? That doesn't exclude you from learning about evolution. In fact, it helps you to own that a little bit better. But um, there was this idea that God created every, and again, you may still believe that, and that is fine, but that God created every species uniquely in each place that you could find that species. And so that was in his head. So he's taking this trip on this boat and he's making some observations. So here, these pictures relate, like if you look here at picture B, then this is where he was when he made these observations, just to kind of show you that. And I just thought that was a cool picture of Darwin. So um, a couple things he made, general observations. The Rhea looked like, now he's in South America, but it looked just like the African ostrich, very, very similar. There were differences. So he wondered, did you know God make the Rhea only in South America and the ostrich only in Africa, or could they have had a common ancestor? Or could it, is it possible that because the environments were similar, it selected similar traits? Um, on the Galapagos Island, you have this unique endemic species of marine iguanas where you only see them going out on the rocks and eating algae just here. Why is that? Um, on the Galapagos Islands, he also saw the finches, which you've known about, and the honey creepers, even more variety, but these finches. They were so specialized to what they eat, beak size, their feet, uh, whether they were on the eating things from the tree or on the ground. So they had all this um, unique exploitation of their environment, and that's called adaptive radiation. We now talk about that now. So that's some of the things he was looking at. He was also comparing environments. When he was looking at the Patagonian desert, um, right here, I'll highlight it there, um, very sparse, but then he would look at these, um, you know, really lush vegetation, vegetation in rainforests and here up the coast a bit. And he would notice the species that were unique to those environments and start to think, let's see, does the environment um, have an impact on what organisms survive and reproduce there? And then, also, when he's looking at the environment, he's looking at these rock layers, and within those rock layers, there are fossils. So how did they get there, right? How did, how did that occur over time, and why do those fossils change? So on your notes, um, I've given you all of that history except down to number four on your notes underneath the first box in 15.1, Darwin's trip, okay? Number four is his viewpoint began changing throughout the voyage. Several other scientists also influenced him before, during, and after his journey. So we're going to talk about the before, during, and after, and the before is where I want to start. So one of the people, and this is about 100 years earlier than his trip, is Linnaeus. Now, Linnaeus, you may remember, is the one who came up with binomial nomenclature. And... Um, like other taxonomists at his times, he believed in fixity of species, meaning that each one was individually created by God. Um, he did mostly, he did, worked on plants. Um, and um, on your notes, what you want to add on there is Linnaeus, 1707 to 1778. I already have that for you. You don't need to memorize that. It's just about 100 years before Darwin was binomial nomenclature and classified all known plants. Okay, so he believed in fixity of species. It was created and that's it, the end. And this is some of his literature. I thought I would get you a real picture. All right, then we have um, Leclerc or Count Buffon. Buffon, uh, it's a hard name to have. So he wrote a 44 volume history of all plants and animals. And this is a picture from one of his books. And he speculated on descent with modification. He speculated on how environment, because he's looking at these animals in different locations and going, hmm, kind of makes sense. This is the kind of organism that you have in 
large grasslands versus what you have in a forest versus what you have in a desert. He looked at the effects of the environment, migration, geographical isolation, because you can be isolated you know, landlocked, not just because you're on an island, right? You're surrounded by water, but you could be have mountains that create an island-like environment, a barrier. He would not commit to the idea of evolution. That would be going against society at that. So um, I believe I gave him already in your notes, and he's tiny because he's he's not that important, but I wanted to include him, okay? Then Erasmus Darwin, this is Charles' grandfather. Okay, and Charles' grandfather was a physician and he was a naturalist and he thought maybe there was this possibility of common descent. He did not have a mechanism for it. Now, by mechanism, I mean, he could think maybe there's change over time, but it, Darwin, the idea of natural selection, he didn't even, you know, he didn't come up with the idea of survival of the fittest. That was Wallace, um, but we'll talk about that later. But the um, natural selection is saying nature has selected which traits are best fit for the environment. He, he didn't have a mechanism like that. He just, maybe there's some dissent. He looked at animal development. He looked at things like vestigial structures, the bone structures in whales um, and vestigial organs. So I have that one all in there for you as well. Okay, another scientist, Cuvier. Cuvier was the father of paleontology, and he would look at, obviously, fossils, right? But he believed in catastrophism. He thought, you know, major events, I'm not talking just a flood, but major events occurred. So it looks like it's changed over time, but it's just because a catastrophe wiped out a bunch of species, but really they were still there. So some other fossils came up that you didn't know about. So that's what he thought. So on your notes for Cuvier, you need to add, he looked at comparative anatomy, comparative anatomy for classification. He founded paleontology founded paleontology. He still believed in fixity of species and special cre creation, and he believed in catastrophism. Okay, and you can spell it out right there. Catastrophes with repopulation gives the appearance of evolution. So things aren't changing, it just kind of looks like it. All right, um, then Lamarck. Lamarck you hear about a lot. Um, he was the first to state descent with modification and give a mechanism, but his mechanism was wrong, okay? Um, so he believed in acquired characteristics. And let me tell you how he would explain the giraffe evolution that you're seeing there in the bottom left-hand corner. What Lamarck would say is, giraffe baby's born, he's reaching his whole life to you know, get the leaves in the upper trees and try to get those leaves. And so his neck stretches over time. So when he gives birth, he gives birth to, ba or sorry, he, she gives birth, they would have giraffes with a little bit longer necks. And then they would stretch, 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 and then their babies would be born with longer necks. So he, you're acquiring that characteristic over your lifetime. Now, I have pierced earrings, right? So what that would say to you is, because I have pierced earrings, then if I acquired that characteristic, could that be passed on to my child? It's that same line of thinking. Right now, it seems like ridiculous, um, but... Um, for Lamarck, here on your notes, he was the first to offer a hypothesis of how evolution occurred via adaptation. He just said those adaptations occurred during a lifetime and got passed on. Okay, so Darwin is a contrast to that because what he would say, and let me explain what Darwin would say about those same giraffes. You have a whole big population of giraffes. There's more giraffes than can survive. Here, let me look at myself because this would be, you know, the kicker. Okay, spoiler alert, explaining natural selection. So there's a large variety. Uh, sorry. Ah. Okay, so you have this population of giraffes too many overproduction of giraffes, all right? And only some of them are gonna be able to survive and reproduce. Some of them were born with longer necks, some medium necks, and some with shorter necks. Who's gonna get the most food? The ones that have the longest necks are gonna be the biggest and the strongest, right? And that is a heritable variation. It's in their DNA. Their DNA coded for longer necks, whereas some giraffes, their DNA coded for shorter necks. Now, Darwin didn't understand about DNA and coding. I'm just explaining that to you now, all right? So it's a heritable variation, that much he agreed on, and it was in your DNA that some or that you had that trait, that you had these longer necks. Those are the ones that are going to survive. Those are the ones that are going to get the most sex. Those are the ones that are going to make the most offspring. So in your second generation of drafts, you're more likely to have those drafts with longer necks 
then shorter necks. And then given a vast amounts of time, right, then you will have longer and longer neck giraffes. So nature is selecting which adaptations are chosen and um, continued on in with descent. Okay, so that is natural selection. That would be Darwin's Darwin's um, idea in contrast to Lamarck. Do not confuse these two. Make sure you can differentiate between them. All right, so I think I gave you everything for um, first off our hypothesis. Yes, so he incorrectly, B, incorrectly proposed the idea of inheritance of acquired characteristics, that you could acquire adaptation. And so his idea is use and disuse. So if you used it, you kept it, and if you didn't use it, you lost it, okay? And I gave you all of that. All right, now, Okay, then while, so that was the historical reference. While Darwin was traveling, he brought some books with him to read. And so he was reading a book by Charles Lyell called Principles of Geology. And basically in this book, it proposed that the earth was a lot older than what people considered it to be um, before this time. And people weren't thinking of millions and millions of years old at this point. So he, this was a new idea. And on your book, um, it says Hutton's theory was published. This was proposed by Hutton, but in Charles Lyell's book, Principles of Geology, discussed the idea that the earth is old, that the earth is old. So Lyell proposed um, uniformitarianism. And Darwin didn't ascribe to this, but this was the idea that you accrue these changes over time um, at a specific rate. And so slow, gradual geologic change. And that was due to erosion. Uh, you got sedimentary layers, et cetera. And so he proposed uniformitarianism. Now, that is not what Darwin would say, but what he took from that is that the earth is old. Okay. Now, Thomas Malthus is a socio socioeconomist. And what he would say and what he proposed is um, that people would outgrow their resources and then this would make that population crack, crash, okay? So if you outgrow your food supply, you're gonna get death and famine. So what does that sound like? The struggle for existence, right? The struggle to live. So I gave you all of that um, and letting you know that Darwin used these ideas as he's traveling on his ship, he's reading these books and putting it all together, okay, in order to build his, his theory on the mechanism for evolution. So let's talk about Darwin's theory of evolution, and this is part one, be on your notes, 15.2, all right? Now, um, so here's Darwin Young, Darwin Old. Now, in between that time of his journey, right, he had these ideas, but he was a very afraid to publish this idea of change over time, heritable change over time. But on his journey, he would look at different things like seashells on beaches. And think about that. So this is not just like dirt, you know, covered up, but you're like, if there were seashells along the beaches right here, what does that tell you about that earth in that location, right? It was once underwater. So this earth must have changed over time because there were seashells there, right? God probably didn't put those seashells and jam them into that dirt, right? That more than likely at that point, this was covered with water and it is now not covered with water. So did it rise in some way? Did the sea, uh, did the uh, waters go down in some ways? And what organisms live here now and the species that were here didn't live there originally. So that's part of what he was thinking. So on observations of change over time, if given enough time, species could change over time. And his evidence are those marine seashells um, inland and on raised beaches. And also he was looking at fossils. He was looking at remains of organisms and he thought, boy, this species right here, when you would look at these fossils, this sure looks a lot like an armadillo when he looked at the bones. And when we look at this organism, he sure looks like a sloth. And so bones of extinct organisms that were similar to extant or living organisms, he was making that. So extinct, dead, extant, living, okay, organisms. And then on top of that, he was making biogeographical observations. And so 
I'm going to talk about this in a bigger picture of how we understand this now, okay? But what he was noticing, remember I told you about the Andes, and you look at the lush vegetation and look to see what organisms live there. Biogeography today studies the range and geographic distribution of organisms. It looks at their migration patterns, how they get there. Now we know about um, plate tectonics and the plate shifting and moving, right? So when you look at Antarctica, where it's freezing, why are there fossils of amphibians there? Well, you know, Antarctica wasn't always in a location where it was cold. So as the plate shifted, right, the organisms that could survive on that plate would vary. So we have that understanding now. So it looks at climate, it looks at geological forces that move those plates. Um, and it explains why you see distribution patterns of different fossils. When you had Pangaea, the supercontinent, and they were all joined together, now we know as a piece of evidence, when you see a type of fern that is universal in that area, and then when the, the plates spread apart, you see that, and if you could just puzzle piece them back together, it makes sense why you would find that little bit of fern on each of those continents, right? So that's the bigger idea of biogeography that we're gonna talk about as one of our pieces of evidence, but he was just making early observations about that and looking at what species what species were in what location. So on biogeographical observation, defined study of the geographical distribution of organisms throughout the world. So his evidence, similar environments seem to produce similar organisms regardless of the location. And so one of those observations, okay, was he looked at the Patagonian hare, like in Patagonia, the bottom right okay and it's native to south america but south america doesn't have any rabbits but this kind of looks like a rabbit face and rabbit legs um and or a guinea pig face um and rabbit legs and so could they have come from a common ancestor was their descent with modification or did they have similar environments which caused those adaptations to be selected for okay um also on the galapagos island he saw a lot of marine fossils like i said he experienced those earthquakes, which would tell you, hey, things are shifting here on our planet. And then he looked at animals that had slight variations on each of the Galapagos Islands. And one of the animals that he looked at was the tortoise. And let me explain that. Okay, so the neck and the shell shape vary depending on what island you are on. So look at this tortoise right here. A lot of vegetation on the ground, so all you have to do is lean down and get at your plants. Now, look at this tortoise right here. No vegetation on the ground. Let's look at him from the front. Look at the shape of his shell. Do you see that, how it curves up like that? That's because in order for him to get food, he has to raise his neck up high to get at the lowest leaves of the branches. Why do you only find those tortoises on islands that don't have low-lying vegetation and these tortoises here? Again, not trying to be argumentative, but did God make these tortoises just for these uh, this island and these tortoises just for this island? Or could these two tortoises had common ancestors? And those tortoises that were on the island with no low-lying vegetation, the ones who had a little bit of curve in their shell, those are the ones that survived and reproduced. And when they made offspring, some of their offspring had a little more curve. So those are the ones that got a little more food. And over vast amounts of time, you see this great big arch in their shell, which allowed them to get at that food. Okay, and I gave you, think tortoise variations. I gave you that. Okay, and then these different birds that look like a penguin, but there's never been such a small penguin there before, right? So um, there are frigate birds that were flightless. Uh, uh, what are they? Camerons? Shoot, I can't remember the name, but I'm sure I'll think of it in class. Um, anyway, so there were very unique species adapted to their particular environment. And like I said, I talked about this guy a little earlier. All right, and then you can't talk about Darwin without on his journey without talking about all the finches and the observations that he made and the specialization that they had and how that varied depending on their environment and what food was there. Remember, this comes out of overproduction of young, young and so you have competition. And so what you're trying to do is decrease competition. I'll eat the big seeds and I have a beak that can break them. You eat the smaller seeds, you have a smaller beak to eat those smaller seeds. 
All right. And then here you can see actual pictures of the different finches. And I believe I gave those all to you. So then this leads us to his book, The Origin of Species by the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. Um, and a, the preservation of favored races, I know that sounds a little terrifying, in the struggle for life. So you've got to have a struggle, right? Overproduction of young, there's a struggle. And some are better adapted to their environment than others. Now, he did not want to publish this. What pushed him into publishing was a person who knew Darwin wrote papers. He just wouldn't come out and say it, right? So a man named Alfred Wallace, he was a naturalist and a school teacher. He's the one, he, he also proposed natural selection and he wrote a paper about it and he sent it to Darwin, which was freaking Darwin out because he's like, oh my gosh, I've thought this for years and years and years. And so what they ended up doing is they co-published it. Now, how... Alfred Wallace had his epiphany. It was when he was on his trip um, traveling, um, he, he got malaria. And so while he was trying to survive that, he came up with the phrase survival of the fittest. Darwin did not come up with that. And it, it kind of threw Darwin for a loop when he read it. And so they had a joint paper. Now, besides this, Wallace is the one who talked about um, having these biogeographical regions. So Australia is clearly an island, right? So you you know it's surrounded by water, so it's hard for things to get off and on and off that island. So we know of particular mammals that you only see like a koala bear only there, right? But there are other regions too that are separated by deserts where it might as well be water because the species are separated. From North America and South America, you have uh, islands, that, uh, sorry, islands, mountains that are difficult to get across. So it makes South America like an island, right? Even though it is a continuous land area. So he came up with that as well. So on natural selection, I gave you that. I gave you the idea. I, I talked about Alfred Wallace. And now let's talk about the idea of natural selection. So um, this is his framework, his scaffolding for how evolution would occur. Remember, evolution is cumulative changes in a population. Individuals do not evolve, populations evolve. So like I said, overproduction of offspring, you have a struggle for survive to survive. So some are going to be better competitors than other others. You're going to have variations in your offspring. Those variations have to be heritable, meaning passed on to your offspring, right? Having a pierced ear is not a heritable, right? I have two sons. They were not born with pierced ears. It has to be in your DNA. Okay. So in this case, some hummingbirds having a longer beak to access the food inside that flower. Okay, nature selects which adaptations are better, like the longer beaks, and over time, then hummingbird, hummingbird beaks would get longer and longer, up to a point, right? Because then it actually gets in the way. And so on your notes, organisms have heritable variations. Okay, organisms have heritable meaning. You're going to pass it on in your genes. So just take a look at all these beetles. Look at this mass variation. It's not like I have every beetle here in this picture. Darwin didn't know how those variations came to be. Now, if Darwin could have talk, spoken to his contemporary Mendel, right? And Mendel was studying variation, right? If they could have talked, that would have helped Darwin tremendously. There was no internet. He couldn't read his papers. He didn't know, right? Mendel didn't even know what he had discovered. But, um, he, but these variations are critical because what's happening is for this particular beetle, having this red stripe on the back of him makes him more likely to survive and reproduce in his environment where a similar beetle maybe that doesn't have that red stripe, it's better not to have the red stripe or having these pinchers that are huge or whatever their variation is. So Darwin couldn't explain the heritable variation, but he knew species had variations and some of those variations made them more likely to survive and reproduce. So fill, filling in your notes, you need to put in heritable variation and C, to be an adaptation, it must be heritable. And Darwin could not state the cause of variations because there was no genetics yet. There was not the study of genetics. So organisms compete for resources. That that So there's an overproduction of young, so that's the struggle for existence. And here, let's take a look out here on the plains. So they are all struggling amongst themselves, these lionesses, 
to survive and reproduce, right? This prey has adaptations to help the prey survive and reproduce. It's a constant struggle. And this would be coevolution because they are going to drive each other because the lioness wants to be a better predator, right? And what it's eating looks like a wildebeest or something. Or, um, it's trying to be, um, doesn't want to be a prey, right? It wants to be able to get away. And when we talk about how fit an organism is, like I said in the very beginning, that's your ability to pass on your DNA as your fitness, right? Um, your And what contributes to your fitness is your adaptation. So um, on your notes, you want to have organisms compete for resources. And this applied Malthus's ideas, right, that um, if you don't have enough resources, the population is going to uh, decrease, right? So um, overproduction potential, you have competition, then organisms differ in their reproductive success. Organisms differ in their reproductive success. Differential reproductive success, the ability to have more offspring as a result of acquiring more resources, more resources. And then fitness is your reproductive success of an individual relative to the other members of his population. So your fitness is merit. You can think of it individually, your fitness to survive and your ability to reproduce. It's going to select those traits, right, that make you better adapted to that environment. So we can look at different adaptations. Adaptations are a trait that helps an organism be more suited to its environment, and it's selected by that environment. And so here to have large blood volume or to receive less um, blood in your extremities during dives or to have more blubber, these are all adaptations. Now I'm an Oak Park Eagle. And so looking at some of the adaptations that Eagles have is a tongue thick and strong for pushing big chunks of fish down their throat. Um, the throat is stretchy, so big chunks of fish can go down the hatch. These are all adaptations of eagles. So on your notes, organisms become adapted. An adaptation is any evolved trait that helps an organism be more suited to its environment, be more suited to its environment. Now, we need to talk about convergent evolution. This is we have stumbled upon the same adaptation because we live in the same environment. So for instance, hummingbirds have wings, right? You're looking at the hummingbird's wings and bees have wings, but are they related? No, they're just responding to their environment in the same way, okay, um, by flying. So for instance, um, whales have fins and fish have fins. Whales are mammals. Um, fish are not mammals, but they're dealing with their environment in the same way um, by using fins to help direct them through the water. That is convergent evolution. We converged on the same idea in order to help our survival. You need to look out for that because it doesn't mean necessarily that you are related to one another. Okay, as opposed to parallel evolution, let's talk about this, and I'll hit these again later, but here are placental mammals and Australian marsupials, okay? Now, you can see similarities between a marsupial mouse and a placental mouse. Now, do they have a common ancestor that is a mammal? Yes, but there are different types of mammals. For instance, there's one more, right, Monotreme, monotremes, um, which I'll go into you later, go in with you later, but they are having the same niche, like the cat niche, um, the bobcat versus the Tasmanian tiger cat. Um, you have the Tasmanian wolf versus a wolf. So they ended up, they in there here, I have a definition right here for you. Okay. When two or more different species that are related, so back in their ancestral past, they shared a mammal and ended up converging, kind of having the same kind of pathway for their particular environment that was not found in their common ancestor. So you might want to add that. I, I'm throwing it in here just to introduce the different types of evolution. So I gave you conversion evolution when unrelated organisms living in similar environments display similar characteristics, as opposed to parallel evolution. Um, you can add that where in their ancestral past, they are related, but they ended up solving the problem in the same way. So they took a parallel path. All right. Now, um, the last little bit, I want to talk about that last box there on observations of selection for today. Um, 
is the artificial selection is just like what it sounds like. It was when man selects what traits are best fit for the environment. So um, Darwin observed that individuals are very variable and that the variations are heritable, right? He didn't know about the DNA part, but we know what that means now. And it could change over time, trying to get pigeons that were faster and faster, right? Just look at dog breeds, right? All of these dog breeds have been selected for artificially right in order to uh for whatever for man's purpose so that is artificial selection humans select which traits are valued and i would think um dog breeding okay here's another example of artificial selection these three okay the chinese cabbage brussels sprouts and kohlrabi all came from this one species this was artificially selected for Okay, um, the next one on there is beak depth and weather, and I'm talking about Darwin's finches. So here you can see, and remember this is underneath observations of selections, so this can be seen within a lifetime, right? Between 1977 and 1984, how big the beaks are vary on whether it is a dry year or a wet year. So you can observe this selection within your lifetime. And yet another one that was observed was industrial melanism. And we'll talk a little bit about this later um, as a form of microevolution, but pre-industrial revolution, no soot on the tree. Within the species, you had the darker colored moth and the lighter colored moth within, that was a variation within a single species. Well, which ones are gonna be seen more readily by birds and eaten? Well, probably this darker colored one. And so their frequency of being a dark, just like you have brown eyes and blue eyes, right? The frequency of the brown eyed allele would go down and the white or gray allele would go up. But post-industrial um, revolution, when there's soot on the trees, it's not good to be light colored anymore. It's better to be dark colored. So the allele frequency for the dark colored moth increased and the light colored moth decreased. So that's what I mean by industrial melanism. And then here's another one we can observe, and this is terrifying, is antibiotic resistance, right? So you could have a whole bunch of bacteria in your body and you take antibiotics that work against the yellow ones, right? So the yellow numbers are gonna go down because that antibiotic is killing them, but if you have a few resistant bacteria in there and this antibiotic doesn't kill them, then their numbers are going to increase over time, and that is exactly what's happening to us as a society. We have um, antibiotic you know, lotions and creams and cutting boards, and we are killing off all the weakest of bacteria and the stronger bacteria that we are more, that have more and more resistance are the ones that are surviving and thriving. And we need to be concerned because we could run out of antibiotics and then we would not have a way to defend ourselves. All right. And then that I believe is, uh, leads us to just a little summary I wanted to go over with you. I'll try to get out of the way here. I'll go over here. I'll go over here. So first of all, okay, summary of natural selection. You have variation amongst your species. You have this yellow and brown color within your population of butterflies, okay? There's competition because there's overproduction of young. So here, right, uh, they are, when they're caterpillars, they're all competing for different food sources. So there's competition amongst them. Some of them, and so only some of them are going to make it, then some of them have better adaptations than others. So birds are hunting, right? And it's easier to see these lighter colored caterpillars. So those numbers are probably going to die off, whereas the di darker colored caterpillars are the ones surviving and reproducing. And so what are you going to get over time is you're going to select for the darker colored butterfly. All right. So that is it. Um, hopefully that was helpful for you. And if you are one of my students, I'll see you in class.